All right, it's come in charge. Hey, if you're in power, do you want to give it up? No. No. Of course not. We'll put this somewhere. All right, so um, I'm Mark Adams. I've got a shirt that sort of explains our problem. Obey propaganda in a state of chaos. Okay, the problem is we've been obeying propaganda for 100 years. That's right. We don't really know the difference between truth and fiction. That's a big problem. Now, Plato said that a couple thousand years ago, 2,500 years ago. Plato, in his uh, allegory of the cave, said, if you keep people in the dark and you feed them BS, they won't know the truth when they see it. If someone tells them the truth and shows them the truth, they still will not understand what they've just seen and heard. Yeah. So naturally, because we have the most advanced um, propaganda machine in history, <laughs> we, uh, we have a serious problem. So, something that's, um, well, let me just start with this. There's a group, you've probably never heard of them. They've been around since the 50s. They're called the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Okay, what they do is they, they test civic li literacy. Could you just speak a little bit about the that maybe the Oath Keeper Service is looking at? Sure, sure. So the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, they test civic literacy. Okay, and what they do is they test high school graduates, they test, test college students, they test college graduates, they've even tested elected officials. Now, you would, well, what they do is they do polls, and they've, they've actually done surveys in writing with college students coming in to colleges like Yale and Princeton and Harvard, top colleges, and what their results show is a high school graduate actually has the, the best understanding of American history and civics of any other group survey. What happens is when you go through college, your understanding of <coughs> civics and history declines. You get more confused. So you do less well than someone that only has a high school degree. Okay, that's intentional, obviously. They've termed it negative learning. Now, some people out there, maybe if they're hearing this on the internet, they might think, oh, well, this is a, because uh, I've heard this group accused of being this, a right-wing group. Okay, well, actually the group uses government questions, questions from the immigration and naturalization exam, questions from the Department of Education's uh, grade 12 history exam, model history exam. So they're using government questions, and they're showing that high schoolers have a better understanding of people who, of American civics, that's government, and history, than do college graduates. And the people that score the worst, the worst of all, are people who serve in elected office. <laughs> Is that pretty amazing or what? That just totally rings true. <laughs> it does totally ring true. Now, I mean, we could go into, is that planned or not planned? It's actually planned. Okay, who do you want? Do you want a, a puppet that knows nothing? Or a puppet that can understand his power and understand what's going on and understand his actions and might do the right thing? You want an ignorant puppet that follows orders. Okay, that's what you want. That's what we have. That's what we've had for a long time. Um, Shakespeare actually said almost the same thing as Plato. Shakespeare, he, he probably read Plato. But he said, if you want to take over a country, the first thing you do is kill all the lawyers. Why is that? Because lawyers know how the system's supposed to work. The next thing you do is you kill everybody that can read and write. So you destroy all the knowledge in the country of how things how things are supposed to operate within the country. Sounds like Actually, it was used by us 
in Cambodia. We back in the Khmer Rouge. That's what they did when they Paul Black. He got rid of first um, lawyers, doctors, judges, then down to teachers. Okay, he tried to destroy him, and he was our boy, the sick, the people that run the world. Paul Pot worked for them. We, the United States government, funded the Khmer Rouge. Okay, that was an attempt to see if Shakespeare's method of control would work. Problem is, that causes a lot of problems. And, you know, thank goodness we got a Second Amendment and we're a well armed citizenry. Otherwise, they might have tried to hear it. So, anyway, something that's almost disappeared from history is the discussion that uh, Jefferson and Madison had, you know, the author of the uh, Declaration of Independence and the author of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights had about forms of government. People don't understand what they said because they've never heard what they said. You heard it last month because I mentioned it. But anyway, Jefferson said there's two forms of government. Aristocracy or democracy. Okay, that's it. Either you're asking people to make the decisions or you're begging rulers to act justly. Two forms of government. Now, some people will say, oh, well, we have a republic. Article 4, Section 4 of the Constitution says the federal government has the power to make sure the states have a republican form of government. Okay, well, what what the word republic come from? It came from the Roman Republic, where it had frequent elections and three branches of government. Okay? The Roman people elected their legislators. They elected their executives, and they had three branches of government. They followed a general principle, like a constitution, certain things you could not do. You could not bring your army across the Rubicon. That's where crossing the Rubicon comes from. Okay? That was one of the things that Julius Caesar did when he moved in to seize power. He brought his army into Rome, into Rome. He crossed the Rubicon. Okay, so that's what the framers meant when they said they were guaranteeing us a Republican form of government. They were guaranteeing that we would have separation of powers and regular elections of all our representatives. Okay? But like, like we talked about a minute ago, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute has shown we have the most ignorant representatives, most ignorant of U.S. government and history. So how do you get that? I mean, you have these two parties. And what the TV tells us in the newspaper, the ministry, what they tell us is there's this big war between these two ideologies, these two big parties. They're fighting for their view of what is best for all of us. Okay, now you would think if they were doing that, wouldn't they all run candidates for every office that's open and try and get their view out before the public? Even in a gerrymandered district where they know they have no chance of winning, don't you think they have somebody that would want to run? Okay. Well, something that was missed by the news media over the last weekend is most of the incumbents in Florida Senate were not challenged by anyone. Out of 20 Florida State Senate seats open for election this year, that's half the Senate, eight of them had no one run against them. Okay? Three of them had only write-in or third-party candidates or NPA candidates run against them. So 11 out of 20 have been re-elected because neither party challenged these people. And you have the Tea Party groups, and you have Americans for Prosperity, and you have the Campaign for Liberty claiming they're trying to go out there and push for reform. How do you push for reform when you won't challenge the people in power? You don't. You're not. You're not pushing for reform if you're not challenging the people in power. 
So, I mean, right there is the crux of the issue. We have an illusion of two groups and a bunch of reform groups supposedly representing our interests. I mean, we're concerned. We have a crowd here tonight of people who are concerned about what's going on in this country. And there's millions of people across America who are concerned about what's going on with our country. And yet the two parties who pretend they're looking out for our interests don't even go to the trouble of running people for office. The reform groups don't tell people, hey, you know, the first thing to do to put pressure on the people in office is challenge them. They don't even say that. The only group in Florida that I know of, and I stay aware of what's going on quite a bit, that's trying to get anyone, that has tried to get anyone to run for office in the last two elections in Florida has been the Libertarian Party of Florida, and that's mainly Alex Nicker. Okay? Everybody else has done nothing. Actually, the, the two big parties dissuade people from challenging incumbents. Okay? If it's a Republican incumbent, what the local party leaders will tell you if you say, I, I think I'm going to challenge Gus Miller-Rackus. They will say, no, 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 don't do that. We don't like him 100%, but he's one of ours. So don't challenge him. And if you go to the Democrats and you say, I, I'm a Democrat, I want to challenge Gus Miller-Rackus. They'll tell you, oh, that's, that's unwinnable, we can't support you. They'll dissuade you from running. They do the opposite of what the news media paints the picture of. The folks from the ministry once again paint the picture that there's these two big parties and they're vying for our best interest. It's all a show. Have you ever watched the movie The Matrix? Watch it again. Almost everything you believe is a lie. Alright, so what's a democracy? Remember Jefferson and Madison have a discussion about what forms of government there are. They say there are two forms of government, aristocracy or democracy. Aristocracy, you beg your representatives to be nice to you. You beg a judge to rule justly in your case. You beg a regulator to let you capture rainwater on your farm. Okay? That's an aristocracy. You beg these people. In a democracy, people make the decisions, okay? Because government, there, there's two basic roles of government. Lawmaking and law enforcement. Elections for the legislative branch give our influence to the lawmaking function. Now I just explained, we only have a pretended influence on the lawmaking function because the two big parties and the reform groups only pretend to run anyone against the incumbent. In other words, they, they serve to keep the incumbents in power. In addition to that, the votes are counted in secret now. That's unconstitutional. It's been proven to be rigged multiple times. I've proven it to be rigged here in Florida in multiple elections. And when I say I've proven it, I've gotten affidavits from voters that when we compare the affidavits of the voters saying, this is how I voted to the secret vote count, it says the secret vote count is wrong. Now Kevin can tell you, because he's a, you know, he's a poll um, worker, he can tell you that there are situations where they've also had phantom voters. And that is true, they've had phantom voters. What's a phantom voter? Well, there's a poll register and people sign in, and usually, typical big election, about 50% of the registered voters in a precinct sign in and say they voted. Okay? Well, when they come back to fudge the numbers that night to pick the winner, one thing they do is they flip votes from one candidate to the other, but another thing they do is they'll just say more people voted, and they voted for this guy. Those are phantom voters. Kevin's told me in a precinct that he... He worked himself. What was the percentage turnout after? Initially, it was what? 62%. Okay, 62. And then? The next day, we got up from that, you know, it was 109. 62 to 109. Now, there can never be more than 100% of voters 
Can there? Well, yeah. that's magical. Remember, it's all counter on computers now. So a hacker, like with a target thing, a hacker can hack it and tweak it. Okay. Thank you. Do it Let me get the questions at the end. All right. So two functions of government: lawmaking. We're we're just talking about that elections are a sham. The two big parties really aren't vying to change who's in power. The reform groups, for the most part, really aren't vying to change who's in power. Okay, they're not running challengers to the incumbents. Okay, the other function is law enforcement. How do people control law enforcement? They don't. Well, no, they're supposed to control it because what Jefferson said is juries are the only means which can make a government follow the law, in essence, is what he said. Okay, what did he mean there? Well, Jefferson, in addition to being the author of the Declaration of Independence, was an attorney, he was a legal scholar, he was the president, two-term president of the U.S., okay? He understood what he was talking about. What he was talking about there is when you have someone who, say, committed a crime, submitted fraudulent documents to steal your home to the court. You're supposed to have two protections there. First of all, the judge is not supposed to be the decision maker. It's supposed to be a jury trial. You know, all trials were supposed to be by jury because what a mortgage, what they'll tell you is a mortgage is magical. It's a contract that's secured. And somehow or other, that takes the contract out of a common law action to an equitable action. Well, let me tell you, until 1830, all actions in America were tried by jury. There was no distinction in America between common law and, and equitable jurisdiction. That was one of the things that the American colonies did not like about the English system of justice. They did not like the chancery or the ecclesiastical, also known as the equitable courts in Great Britain. And when they came to America, mainly due to a small population, they consolidated all that, consolidated all that. So what you had was juries determining all matters that were meaningful. Over $20 is what the framer said. If it's worth more than $20, it's supposed to be decided by a jury, not by a judge. Okay? 1830, the Supreme Court out of thin air, with no one complaining about a jury deciding the case, says, oh, well, you know, juries don't have to decide equitable proceedings. Okay. Lawyers don't know that. They're not taught that in school. Okay. Lawyers don't know what the hell happened to your right in jury trial. Ask one. It's like deer in the headlight look. It's fun. I have done it to a bunch of them. I've done it here in this room to people speaking. Just because I get sick of hearing bullshit. Um, Anyway, it, when FDR was president, FDR passed the Federal Rules of Civil and Criminal Procedure. And he passed a rule, a rule of civil procedure, saying, oh, well, you know, all those jury trial rights, you know, those other cases that we haven't already had stolen away, a judge can just decide who's the winner by granting summary judgment. Now, there was no amendment to that right to jury trial allowing a judge to usurp that right. But it happened. And you know, the, the ruling elite in the various states passed rules modeled on the federal rules. And all across the country, while the people were distracted by manufactured poverty and war, everybody lost their right to jury trial in some cases. Now judges will enter judgment based on who's paid them off, or in favor of the government, because they don't like the hand that feeds them. That's why Alexander Hamlin said we love the right to trial by jury, because judges, there's always more time and opportunity to improperly influence the standing body of judges than there is to improperly influence citizens summoned for jury duty. Now, that's the defensive. The jury is a defensive nature uh, so, in general, you're pleading to the jury to defend your rights or defend your property rights, defend your liberty. But the grand jury is the one that 
really brings your right to petition the redress of criminal grievances to the forefront. Because when you can go to a citizen serving on the jury and you say, this bank filed this fraudulent document saying they want to steal my home, that they have the right to take it when it's not true, and if you could take that to a grand jury, the citizens on the grand jury might indict those banksters. You know, that's what the robo-signing scandal was. Right. Okay? Robo-signing is a cute term for filing fraudulent documents to steal homes. Okay, that's a cute term for it. That's the, the ministry, the news media, sort of washing away some criminality there. If you could take that to a grand jury and ask the grand jury to indict the people for filing a falsified document in a court case, or for committing any other crime, say for instance, ordering a sailor who's on duty to appear in court or lose his child. That's right. Okay? That's a violation of the law. Well, how does that judge, who's a former prosecutor, think she can get away with that? Right. She knows her buddies, the prosecutors, guard the door to the grand jury now. Because FDR, the fascist takeover of America, passed the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. And it says only a U.S. attorney can present evidence to the citizen serving on the grand jury now. And once again, the states pretty much followed suit. There's only a couple states where you can still legally walk in and present evidence to a grand jury. And even in those states, the prosecutor will try to bar the door because they assume all the people are ignorant of their rights. Okay? And they assume that they can get away with whatever they want to get away with because the press covers up corruption. Once again, submitting false documents to steal homes, the press calls robo signing, not felony, perjury, stuff like that. So, the power to enforce the law, the power to make the law, pretty much is gone. Not completely, because if people realize that the first thing we need to do is actually challenge the incumbents by running someone against them, then people can make a difference. Okay, so awareness of that can make a difference. If people realize that counting votes in secret is unconstitutional, when I say unconstitutional, I, I mean unconstitutional as in prohibited by three U.S. Supreme Court decisions that say the right the vote includes not only the right to cast the ballot, but the right to make sure it's counted accurately. And you can't make sure it's counted accurately when your vote's counted in secret on a computer. And there's seven state constitutions that specifically say that the votes either have to be counted in public or cannot be counted in secret. Okay, so if people would talk about that, but once again, the reason people aren't talking about that is because all the reform groups, for the most part, are propped up by the scum and charge. Okay, so you have to realize that if you're supporting Americans for prosperity, you're not helping the good guys, you're helping the bad guys. If you're supporting the campaign for liberty, you're not helping the good guys, you're helping the bad guys. You have to reject people who will not tell you how your rights are supposed to be secured. Who will not suggest to you someone ought to tell those people that are incumbents. I mean, the incumbents have among the lowest level of respect from the public. The public is highly dissatisfied with the people in power. And then once again, right here in Florida, we have 11 out of 20 incumbent state senators unchallenged. We have four out of 27 members of Congress unchallenged. And like I was telling somebody earlier, I could go through the other challenges to members of Congress, and it would probably turn into only about four real challenges to the members of Congress. Okay, the 27 members of Congress in Florida. Now, so what you have to do to make a difference is you have to realize you have to put pressure on people in power to restore your rights. The best way to do that is challenge them for office. To talk about the rights we're supposed to have. Read the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, they complain about the theft of our right 
to enforce the law repeatedly. They complain about taxation without representation one time. Okay? You cannot listen to the ministry. The ministry is the educational system. You have a better, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute has shown you have a better education just coming out of high school than some about American history and government than someone who's gone to college. And I can tell you from going to law school, they give you a bunch of crap to read, and then one day they tell you, oh, you know, judges can grant summary judgment. Okay, so they don't really have a right to jury trial. Okay, that's why I said it's fun to ask an attorney, what happened to our right to jury trial? Oh, they passed this rule saying judges can grant summary judgment. Okay, a rule which which undermines the constitutional right. Is that constitutional? No. No, of course not. That's unconstitutional. That's a theft of your rights. What's up? Okay. Um, can I take one question? Somebody have a question. Uh, it seems obvious to me that you should have a voter, you should have a, a picture ID when you can go vote. Yes. But there seems to be a big fight against that. Mm -hmm. Is that to prevent? Is the fight against having a picture ID uh, for voting because they don't want to, if they did that, uh, they would get rid of that, that would help get rid of the fraud that goes on? No, actually that's a distraction technique. Okay, so the question was, because there's two different stories about why we don't have fair elections. In other words, why we got these problems with all these people in office that we're unhappy with. And their two stories are the story for the right conservative audience is that you got all these illegals and these union members voting multiple times because people don't have to have an ID to vote. Well, in actuality, you do have to have an ID to vote. Usually it's not a picture ID, but, you know, I mean, if you've gone to the vote a few times over your lifetime, which I'm sure most of you have, you usually have to have at least a voter card, okay? And so that's the story for the conservative wing. The story for the liberal wing with why all the incumbents are bad and don't listen to them is, is that it's so hard to get up there and go vote because you've got to go get an ID. Are you kidding me? Okay, getting an ID is relatively easy even with the crazy National ID Act. Okay, you produce a couple documents and you have an ID. It's relatively easy. All these groups working on those problems on both sides they never mention that your votes are counted in secret. They never mention that most of the incumbents go unchallenged. Because they're there to distract from the main issue. So thanks for that question. All right, thanks folks. Thank you very much.